morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us live today from the Museum of the Rockies. We are really excited to be wrapping up 2019 with you today and to talk about dinosaurs. I'm Jamie Ox, I'm the Outreach Manager here at the Museum of the Rockies, and I'd like to introduce you to Dr. John Scanella. Hello. John is the John R. Horner Curator of Paleontology. Dr. Scanella studies dinosaur evolution and growth and is passionate about sharing the excitement and importance of paleontology with you today. In just a few minutes, Dr. Scanella will help us explore the life patterns of dinosaurs to help us better understand how they grew up. On your screen, you should see and hear me at this point. If you cannot, please let us know and type into the chat box so our friends at Streamable Learning can help us with any IT needs. Thank you for being on hand today, friends at Streamable Learning. Um, feel free to use that chat box anytime you have a question. We're going to ask you questions throughout the show, um, so answer those in that, that chat box as well. If we're not able to respond to questions immediately, we will do so at the end. So hold tight and we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions. Who's been to the Museum of the Rockies? Has anyone out there visited us before? If you have, you will recognize the entrance to the Museum of the Rockies. Oh, we're not quite there yet, sorry about that. We are in Bozeman, Montana. Mm -hmm. um, we are about 83 miles from Yellowstone National Park and 315 miles from our friends above us in Canada. We're nestled in the beautiful and historic Gallatin Valley on the campus of Montana State University. There we are. There's our entrance to the Museum of the Rockies. We're being greeted by what kind of dinosaur? You can practice typing into that chat box now. If you were thinking T-Rex, you are right. That is Big Mike. He greets you every time you come into the museum. We're going to head inside and make our way to our Cybel Dinosaur Complex. There we go, our dinosaur parade's headed in. We're going to pass the Allosaurus, which we'll talk a little bit about today, possibly. Nope, <laughs> I lied. <laughs> Back to the Hall of Horns and Teeth, where we'll see the T-Rex and the Triceratops, which we will be definitely be talking about today. From here, I'm going to turn it over to John, and he's going to guide us through the rest of today's adventure. Thanks for being here. Hi everyone, um, so I'm John Scanella, uh, Curator of Paleontology here at the Museum of the Rockies, and right now we are downstairs uh, below those exhibits that Jamie just showed you, and we're in one of the collections areas at the museum, so you might be able to see behind me there's lots of cases and cabinets, and those are all filled with the remains of dinosaurs and other ancient creatures. So I am a paleontologist, and a paleontologist is a scientist who studies ancient life. Uh, that means I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about dinosaurs and other creatures and trying to figure out what the world was like a long time ago and how life has evolved uh, and changed over time. And a lot of what paleontologists do and how we learn about the past is through the study of fossils. And fossils are the preserved remains of living things. So this here is an example of a fossil. This is the uh, lower jawbone, the dentary, of a duck-billed dinosaur named Brachylophosaurus that lived in Montana in the Cretaceous period. You can see here there's, there's some teeth still in place in this jaw. And so by studying a fossil like this, we can learn a lot about what uh, this animal might have been like when it was alive. But before, before we can study the fossil, uh, we have to be able to go out and find fossils so we can bring them back to the laboratory and ask questions about them and explore what these creatures were like. And so in order to do that, uh, we have to be able to know where to go to potentially find dinosaurs or other fossils. And so since uh, dinosaurs, uh, most dinosaurs lived a long time ago, we have to be able, in a sense, 
to travel through time to find where, where these dinosaurs are. So this is a chart of uh, geologic time. It's basically kind of like a calendar, but instead of showing days uh, of the month or, or the year, it shows the history of uh, time on Earth. So we're up here at the top, that's today, and all the way at the bottom, uh, that's the beginning of the Earth. And so dinosaurs lived in a time known as the Mesozoic era, right about here in this, these green colors, from about 250 or so million to about 66 million years ago. So if we are looking for the fossils of dinosaurs, we have to go back to the right time period to find their fossils. If we are here today and we go down here, we haven't gone far enough, so we won't find any dinosaurs other than their living descendants, the birds. If we go down here, we can find some cool fossils down here, but we've gone back too far uh, to find the fossils of dinosaurs. So we have to be able to know where we're looking in order to find dinosaur fossils. And in order to do that, uh, paleontologists work very closely with scientists called geologists. And geologists are scientists that study the earth and its processes and patterns and how it works. And some geologists spend quite a bit of time creating maps of the surface of the earth uh, that can help us learn where to go to find certain fossils. So here's an example of one of these maps. If you can see that. So this is a geologic map of Montana uh, put together by the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology in Butte uh, by geologists. And you can see there's a bunch of colors on this map. So here's the state of Montana and all these different colors. And all these colors basically are different geologic formations. So basically that means that every color you see is a different aged rock that is exposed at the surface of Montana. And probably you can tell that a lot of the surface of Montana is this green color. So the colors on this map correspond to uh, different times. And so the age of dinosaurs on this map uh, is the same color as on, on this chart here. These green colors are the Cretaceous period, which is towards the end of the age of dinosaurs. And because there's so much green, you can see that Montana is a great place to go look for dinosaur fossils because there's a lot of the right aged rock at the surface of the earth to go find uh, fossils of dinosaurs. Uh, and on top of that, if we could pull up the first slide, when you go out to say Eastern Montana to look for the fossils of dinosaurs, uh, it has a very distinctive look about it. Uh, when we go out there, we see lots of rolling hills. Uh, I think you can see there. Uh, that is an area of Eastern Montana known as uh, part of the Hell Creek Formation, the geologic unit that represents the very end of the age of dinosaurs. These, this is an area where you might find the fossils of Tyrannosaurus rex or Triceratops, some of, some of the last uh, dinosaurs of the Mesozoic era. And you can see that not only is it the right age of rocks at the surface there, but also uh, you, can, you can look around and find fossils coming out of the hill uh, because it's not covered up by anything. There are many places on Earth today where the right age might be at the surface, but it might be covered in something. So for example, I used to live uh, in New Jersey, and in New Jersey, there are dinosaur fossils that have been found there. The right age rock is at the surface in places in New Jersey, uh, but there might be malls or parking lots on top of the rocks. So it's more difficult to walk around and just find fossils. So Montana, uh, on top of having a lot of the right age rock at the surface, also has a lot of exposure uh, of the rock. So it's easy to go out and uh, find fossils. Now, often we have to get uh, permissions or sometimes we have to uh, apply for various permits to make sure we have the appropriate permissions before we go out looking for fossils. But once we do that, paleontologists can explore and learn about what the world was like a long time ago. So if we could pull up the next slide, Jamie, uh, we'll see some uh, paleo field crews out in Montana uh, searching for fossils and excavating fossils. Uh, and this is what we spend most of our summers 
doing each year, going out to places, uh, looking for uh, new things that we're curious about. And then you see these white blobby looking things. Those are called field jackets. And so if you, uh, I have an example of a field jacket here with me. So maybe you can, you can see this. And this is, uh, Inside of this is part of a dinosaur that was collected in the field, and we wrap the uh, fossils in layers of burlap and plaster to make sort of like a cast to protect the bone. So it's very similar to if a doctor put a cast around a broken arm or leg to protect the bones. Uh, this is basically to protect the fossils when we bring them from the field back to the lab to make sure they safely make it back to the museum. So once this uh, field jacket is taken from the field and brought back to the lab here, if we could pull up the next slide, there are people here at the museum I uh, call fossil preparators, and they work uh, in the prep labs here to open the field jackets and then very carefully remove the rock that has encased the bones for millions of years. And this is a very, can be a very delicate, uh, uh, needs a lot of patience and attention to detail to do fossil preparation, because sometimes the fossils can be very fragile, easy to break. Uh, and so they have to be very careful. And sometimes they have to piece them back together like pieces of a puzzle. But once they uh, do that, then we can study the fossils back in the lab. So I've been uh, talking a bit about collecting the fossils, uh, bringing them back. And I've been mentioning that one of the things I like to work on is dinosaurs. So when I say the word dinosaur, you might have a certain image in your mind of dinosaurs. You might think of Tyrannosaurus rex, the eating dinosaur, or Triceratops, the horned dinosaur, or maybe the giant long-necked dinosaurs like Brachiosaurus or Diplodocus. But one of the cool things to think about with dinosaurs is uh, some of them were really, really big, but they weren't always really, really big. Dinosaurs, like other animals, changed as they grew up. They, they would grow up from a little baby uh, to, in some cases, big, giant animals. And so we can actually learn a lot about how dinosaurs grew and what they were like when they were little and how they changed as they grew up. So, we don't just study giant dinosaur bones, but all sizes of dinosaur bones and other kinds of fossils as well. So for example, can anyone tell me what kind of fossil is this? What is, what is this fossil that I'm holding? Go ahead and type your guesses in the chat box. What is John showing us there? An egg, a T-Rex and Triceratops, a long neck, a Velociraptor, an egg, a scale, a baby dinosaur egg. So some of you said that this was a dinosaur egg, and you are correct. This is a fossilized dinosaur egg. And so you can see it's kind of circular, like eggs today. It's kind of, kind of flat because it's been smushed. Uh, being in the rocks for so long. But one of the cool things that we can find are the fossils of dinosaur eggs. And so in this, in this case, this particular kind of egg, see it has sort of little bumps on it. There are other, other eggs that look different. Like here's, here's another fossilized egg here. And you see the, there's bits of the shell there and it's very smooth. So paleontologists who study dinosaur eggs, one of the things they look at is the surface texture of the egg shells. And some of the first ever dinosaur eggs ever discovered in North America were found right here uh, in Montana about 40 years ago or so. Marion Brandbold, who lived up in the northwestern part of the state, discovered some uh, tiny little bones. And when she had the opportunity, she showed them to Jack Horner and Bob Makala, who were with Princeton University and would later work with the Museum of the Rockies. Jack Horner was the former curator of paleontology here. And they identified the little bones as being little bones of tiny baby dinosaurs, which was really exciting because a 
Until that point, no one had ever really seen tiny baby dinosaur bones. So they asked if she could take them to where she found the bones, and she did. And when they got there, they found more tiny baby dinosaur bones with little bits of dinosaur eggshell around them. And they were in kind of depressions or, or uh, holes in the ground that kind of looked like nests, like the dinosaurs had made a nest and the little baby dinosaurs were inside the nest. And then later outside of, of the uh, nests, they found the remains of bigger dinosaurs that kind of looked like the little dinosaurs in the nest. And then they would find uh, more nests close by. And so this was some of the first ever evidence uh, that some dinosaurs at least may have nested together in groups and also taken care of their little baby dinosaurs uh, for at least some time, which really changed the view of what dinosaurs were like with their behavior. Because before that, dinosaurs were often thought of as being just kind of like big lizards. And many lizards today will just sort of lay their eggs and then walk away. And the eggs kind of have to take care of themselves or the when the babies hatch, they have to take care of themselves. But here there was some evidence that these dinosaurs might have laid their eggs and then the eggs would hatch and would spend some time in the nest. And so the parents would have to care for the babies. And so here is a model of one of these little, little dinosaurs uh, found in, in the nest. And when they found this dino these dinosaurs at that time, this was a species of dinosaur that hadn't been found before. And so they, they gave it a name because it was a new, new kind of dinosaur. And they named this dinosaur Myasaura, which translates to the good mother reptile because there was evidence that uh, this dinosaur at least would take care of the little babies for at least some time. So that was a very exciting discovery. Myasaur is also the state dinosaur of, of Montana, which is also kind of neat. So we can, we can see little baby dinosaur bones that have been discovered and nearby where those little dinosaur bones and the eggs were found, other types of eggs were found as well, uh, including ones that look like this one I showed you a little while ago. Now, does anyone know how we might be able to tell what kind of dinosaur laid this egg. Any, any guesses of how we might be able to see uh, what kind of dinosaur laid an egg like this? Um, Ms. Bodie says that you can tell by the shape and the size. Ms. St. Clair's class says it's from a T-Rex. Ms. White's class says you could open it up. Ah, so these are all, all good answers. Uh, but. Ooh, our friends down at Longfellow said you can dissect it. Dissect the egg, yeah. So one of the things we can do in some cases, if we're lucky to find one that's kind of open, here is a little piece of egg, I think you can see. Is that coming up all right? Give us a second to yeah, focus, focus that. So here's a little bit of eggshell here. There it is. So that's the outside of the egg. And then if we look inside the egg, see that? Those are tiny bones of a little dinosaur embryo still in the egg. And so this, this bone up here on the top, that's uh, called the ilium. That's the hip bone, part of the hip of this little dinosaur. And then here, this long bone, uh, is the femur or the thigh bone going into the socket in the hip where it would be in life. So in this case, we can see inside this egg and see what kind of dinosaur is in there. We can compare uh, the, the bones inside this egg to other bones that have been found. And then we can learn a bit about what kind of dinosaur laid these eggs. And in this case, these eggs were laid by a dinosaur named Truodon. And uh, Truodon looked, uh, a skull of a Truodon, it looked something like this. Uh, so it was a, it's a pretty close cousin of uh, the meat-eating dinosaurs known as raptors. So for example, 
This is the cast uh, of a skull of a velociraptor. And you see velociraptor has these big teeth, these uh, blade-like teeth for eating meat. And so Trudon and its relatives were pretty close cousins. But one of the differences you might see there is the teeth here. Instead of being big blade-like teeth, there's these little differently shaped teeth. So some paleontologists think that maybe Trudon ate both meat and plants. But we've learned a lot about this animal by collecting lots and lots of fossils of it, from all the way from its eggs to little embryos still in the eggs to, in this case, uh, here. Here's a, here's a femur of a truodon. It's the, the same bone that I showed you for the little one that was still in the egg, but here's one from a, a bigger truodon that lived for some time after it hatched out of its egg. And so truodon, big, big. Uh, so we know a lot about the life history of Truodon, all the way from it being teeny tiny to being a full-grown animal, which is pretty cool to be able to see for creatures that lived so long ago. So one of the things we see is how these animals changed as they grew. In this case, Truodon, we can look at the bones and see how it was changing. And it's been discovered that some dinosaurs really changed a lot in how they looked, especially their heads. Uh, and one of the dinosaurs that we have the most of here is a horned dinosaur uh, named Triceratops. This is what a Triceratops would look like. Many of you may be familiar with Triceratops. Uh, it has three horns, one above each eye, and then this horn above its nose. And then at the back of its head, it has this bony frill. And we have lots of fossils of Triceratops here in the museum. I'm gonna show you one. Okay, can anyone tell me what, what part of a Triceratops might this be? What guesses do you have? Type them in. They're too smart, John, they all say horn. Very good, very good. <laughs> so, so this is, yep. The horn of a little Triceratops. Now, Triceratops could get to be really, really big. Uh, sometimes their heads could be almost the size of a car, like Triceratops is, could be a really big animal. But in this case, this is a pretty small Triceratops. So here's the horn, and here is where the eye would be right there. And one of the things you might see here is that the horn actually curves backwards on this Triceratops. So when Triceratops is little, the horns curve backwards. But as it gets bigger, there's a cast of the horn of a bigger triceratops. The eye would have been around here. The horns go from curving backwards to curving more forwards. So by collecting lots of triceratops, we can see how their horns change shape. And not only did the horns of a triceratops change shape as it grew up, but here's, here's triceratops again. It has the horns of the eyes. And then also you see on the back of its head, it has this big bony frill. And around the frill are these spikes. And if we look at the spikes, this here is one of the spikes of a triceratops. This is from a pretty young triceratops. And you can see in this young triceratops, it's very triangular. It's very spiky, the spike from the frill. But if we look at one of these spikes from a bigger, uh, older triceratops, Here's a, here's a piece of the bony frill of a Triceratops. And you see these, one here and one here. These are the spikes on the edge of the frill. And you can see the, the other one that we had from the young Triceratops. It's very triangular, very spiky. But these big ones, they're flatter. They're not as pointy. So Triceratops, as it grew up from a baby to an adult, the horns change shape and the spikes around the frill start out very spiky and then they kind of flatten onto the edge of the frill. And on top of that, uh, there's evidence that the frill itself might have changed shape. I might need some help for this part. Um, well, we grab that. How heavy are triceratops and how many spikes are on the frill? Oh, that's a, 
Those are excellent questions. So uh, the Triceratops would be several tons when it was full grown. The estimates vary a bit, uh, probably in the neighborhood of somewhere between five to 10, oh, sorry, tons uh, at full size. Uh, and how many spikes are on the frill? Uh, that, that can vary a bit uh, depending on which Triceratops you're looking at, but generally you have about six to seven on each bone on the side, and then between, oh, say seven to maybe 12 on the middle bone. Uh, so add all that up, and it'd be quite a few spikes on a Triceratops frill. And the spikes are one of the important things that paleontologists look at in horned dinosaurs, because if you look at different species of horned dinosaurs, often the number of spikes can be different, or they might have different shapes and sizes, like you might be familiar with Styracosaurus is a horned dinosaur with these really big spikes on its frill. So there can be quite a bit of variation in the spikes on the frill of horned dinosaurs. But if we come over here, so this, you can still see me. Uh, this is a, a cast of the middle bone of the frill of a big horned dinosaur. And uh, this is from a dinosaur that's been called Taurosaurus. And so in Triceratops, Triceratops has been known for a long time to have this central bone of the frill, uh, but it's a solid piece of bone. But I am speaking to you from the hole, in one of the holes inside this frill. And so when Taurosaurus was discovered, it was thought this is obviously a different dinosaur than Triceratops because it has these big holes in its frill. But by studying uh, a growth series of Triceratops from little tiny Triceratops all the way to really big ones, it appears that the frill itself would expand and grow and develop thin areas that got thinner as Triceratops got bigger uh, in the same places where here are these holes that I'm speaking to you from. So uh, Taurosaurus, uh, itself, instead of being a different species of uh, horned dinosaur, Taurosaurus, might just be what a really old Triceratops would look like, that its, its frill would keep growing and it would develop these holes that I could then talk to you through. <laughs> so put this back. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. That's okay. You're welcome. So that's one example of of dinosaur heads changing a lot as they grow. Another, another fun example, this here is a, a model of the skull of a, of a cool dinosaur uh, that's named Dracorex Hogwartsia, which is a really cool name because it translates to the Dragon King of Hogwarts from the Harry Potter books. Uh, because it kind of looks, if you look at it, it kind of looks like the skull of a dragon. It's kind of got this low, long face and these big spikes on it. But one of the things that's been discovered more recently is that this was not a very old animal. Uh, it was actually a young animal. And this flat part of the head here didn't always look like this through this animal's life. So as it grew up, the shape of the head would change and it would look something more like this. So you see on this model here, there's a big dome on the head. Uh, and in some cases, the dome would be even bigger than that. And so this flat-headed dinosaur would develop a big dome on its head. And because they were so different looking when they were little, it was given a different name, Draco Rex. But actually, these domed dinosaurs had a name before that, Pachycephalosaurus, the big dome-headed dinosaurs that lived at the time of T-Rex and Triceratops. And so by studying dinosaur growth and how they change through growth, uh, it appears that Dracorex is actually just a young Pachycephalosaurus. So by studying dinosaur growth and how they changed as they grew, uh, we can learn a lot about what their world was like and how many species of dinosaurs were there at one time. So if we look at Dracorex and Pachycephalosaurus, is that 
two species that lived at the same time or or one kind of dinosaur that was around at the same time. Same with Triceratops and Taurosaurus. So we can learn a lot about what the world was like and what the environment was like and how these animals lived and interacted with each other by studying how their heads uh, change shape. Now, not only did, uh, not only can we learn a lot about growth by looking at the outsides of the bones, the shape of the leg bones or the head bones, but we can also learn a lot by looking inside the uh, fossils of dinosaurs and other creatures. And so the Museum of the Rockies here has what's called a paleohistology lab. Uh, and that's basically uh, where we cut out pieces of the fossils of dinosaurs and other creatures and then uh, grind them down so we can examine them under a microscope. So you could pull up the next slide, Jamie. I will take a quick look at some of what we're doing uh, in the paleohistology lab where a lot of science occurs here at the museum. So here in this picture, you can see that we're taking pieces out of the horns of some triceratops. You can see that we might have to saw through in some cases or, or chisel them out. And then uh, they're sliced uh, into pieces that we can work with more easily. And if we go to the next slide, this is uh, Ellen Lamb, our histology lab manager here at the Museum of the Rockies. And what she's doing is she's taken those pieces of bone and ground them down until they're so thin that light will pass through them. And then we can study them under a microscope and see what they look like inside. And we can learn even more by looking inside the bones of dinosaurs. So this I always think is, no, no, <laughs> next. This I always think is kind of a cool thing to look at. Uh, can, can they see me? No, no, you're good. So here, this is the humerus or the arm bone of a little triceratops. It's a pretty, pretty little triceratops because again, they got to be pretty big. But this is a, a triceratops bone that has gone to our histology lab and we've taken a piece out of it so that we can study it under the microscope. And then we actually replace that piece of bone with an exact replica, exact copy of that piece of bone and put it back in there so that uh, paleontologists can still study this bone. They can still measure it or take pictures of it uh, without losing that information from us taking the piece of bone out. So uh, I wonder if any of you could tell me which, what part of this arm bone do you think is not really part of the fossil? So, so parts of this are the actual fossil bone, and then one part of it is a replacement, an exact copy of the original bone. Can you tell? Is it this part up here, the top part? Is it the, the middle part or the bottom part? Which part do you think is not the actual original fossil? Take your best guess. Tell us what you think. Three votes for the bottom so far. The bottom. Top. Top. Anyone else? No? Overwhelming votes for the bottom. Overwhelming votes for the bottom. This is to, to the bottom, that is the actual fossil part of this bone. The top part is the actual original bone. This part right here is not. It is an exact copy of what was once there. So we can take out pieces of dinosaur bone and put back an exact copy that's so good that you couldn't even tell uh, which part of this is not the actual bone. But see, sometimes they're so good that it can be kind of tricky when, we, when we're studying them. So we mark, we mark the part that's been replaced with this yellow tag so that in the future, um, you know, 100, 200 years from now, someone wants to study this bone, we we'll make sure they know that this part here is actually a cast instead of the original bone. So the process that this bone goes through here. Here is another triceratops horn and this is the actual horn here and you see the yellow tag there. 
that means that is an exact copy that was put back uh, that was made in the lab. So as you saw in the pictures before, we will slice out a piece of this, uh, of the actual bone, take that. Here's part of the actual piece that was cut out of this horn. So it's actually this, this bottom part. You see the shape is the same. This is the bottom part. We'll take the uh, actual bone and then we'll make a mold of it. This is a, a mold. So the, the actual bone went in there. We poured some, some uh, rubber over it to make an exact uh, copy of, what, of what, it, what it looked like or, or the inside of it. And we close the mold and in this little hole here, we pour some plastic that then takes the exact shape of what that bone looked like. And then we can either have that exact copy and leave it in whatever color we want. If we want to easily be able to tell that this part is not the actual bone, or in some cases we can paint the, this uh, copy so it looks uh, just like it used to look like. The section of bone the, that isn't there anymore gets embedded uh, in resin like this. So here's a piece of that triceratops horn embedded in resin. And then we take slices out of that and put them on a slide. So here's a, here's a thin uh, section of that triceratops horn and here's a slide that it's been mounted to. And then uh, usually Ellen, uh, our histology lab manager spends many hours slowly grinding, grinding down the surface of this bone making it thinner and thinner and thinner. So you see if I hold up, I hold up this uh, slide here, uh, the, the bone is very dark. You can't see through it. Oops. Can't see through it because it's very, very thick. But once we're done grinding it down, here's a finished slide from the same horn. And my hand is in the way. But see that, see the, the light passes through it because it's been ground down so thin uh, that light can pass through it now. And once light can pass through it, then we can study what it looks like under a microscope. And we can learn a lot about triceratops and other dinosaurs by looking at their bones under a microscope. So if you pull up uh, the next slide, please, Jamie. We'll take a, a look at the insides of the bones of some of the horns that have been cut up of triceratops. And you can see that when you look inside them under a microscope, uh, they look different. So on the left, there's a section of a juvenile, a young, really young Triceratops. We're looking inside its horn core. And you can see that the bone is, has lots of big holes in it. It's very spongy looking. This is what really young, rapidly growing bone looks like. Uh, and then if we go to the next one, the young adult one, you see these circular structures. Now these circles form uh, basically when bone is being eaten away and new bone is being deposited in a process, uh, uh, the way that bones grow and change shape uh, in this case. And so the more of these circles you see basically, the relatively older that individual is. So just by looking at the, the, uh, the slides of these horns under the microscope, we can tell that the one in the middle is relatively older than the little one on the, on the left. And the one on the right has even more of these circles, lots and lots of circles overlapping. Uh, so that is an even older animal than the one in the middle. So uh, just by looking at the slides under a microscope, uh, you, can, you can see the relative ages of these dinosaurs. So that's something we can learn about dinosaur growth in Triceratops, for example, by looking at the horns under a microscope. But something that that hasn't been able to tell us yet is the absolute ages of any of these Triceratops. Like, how old is that little Triceratops? And how old is that big Triceratops? By looking inside the horns with the circles, we can tell this one's a little older than that one, and that one's a little bit older than that one. But we can't say uh, this one's two years old, and this one's five years old, and this one's 10 years old. 
In order to do that, uh, ideally we would look at uh, different parts of the skeleton of a dinosaur. And one of the best places to look is at some of the, the bones of the legs in dinosaurs. So here, this here is a tibia, the shin bone. It is that bone uh, from a myasaura, so the good mother reptile that I talked a little bit, bit about earlier, the duck-billed dinosaur. And in this case, uh, this again has had a piece removed uh, for study. And you see it's painted a little bit of a different color. Maybe you can see it's darker here. This is where a section was taken out. And this is from still a pretty little duck-billed dinosaur. And then here, here's an example of a, of a bigger myasaur tibia, the same bone of the leg. And I can't point at it because I'm holding it, but you might be able to see the little yellow spot. That's, that's where a section was taken out so we could study the microstructure of this animal. And a lot of this work on myasaur leg bones has been done by uh, Dr. Holly Woodward Ballard, who uh, studied here at Montana State University and other, other colleagues. But if we look inside something like the leg bone of a myosaur or another dinosaur, you can pull up the other uh, next slide, Jamie. It looks a bit different than when we look inside uh, the horns, for example, in some cases, because when we look inside uh, limb bones of dinosaurs, there are these lines that we can see. And I, there's some arrows pointing to them here on this picture. And these lines in uh, dinosaurs, they form every year, a line is formed. And so we can count these lines in a bone like this one in the same way that you might count tree rings. So if a tree, if you look inside a tree, it has these rings, these circles that go around it. And you can tell how old that tree was by counting the rings. It's a similar thing with a dinosaur leg bone like this uh, we can count these lines and tell how old this myasaur was at the time that it died. We can do the same thing with other dinosaurs as well. So by counting uh, the lines in the limbs of dinosaurs, uh, we can uh, learn a lot about how they're growing. So for example, with myasaura and this, this dinosaur here, we, by, by looking inside leg bones and looking at how it grew, it's been determined, uh, discovered that a myasaur would hatch out of an egg that would fit in your hand. So a little myasaur would hatch out and it would grow to be almost nine feet long in about a year. So it grew really, really fast. And we can learn this because we can look inside the bones and tell how old uh, a dinosaur is at a certain size. And so we can learn how, how long the dinosaurs might have lived. I think the oldest Minosaur that's been uh, studied so far was about 14 or 15 years old. Uh, and we can learn a lot about other dinosaurs as well. So for example, who can tell me what this is? Or what kind of dinosaur this came from? You guys know this one. Type it in the chat box. No guesses? The bottom jaw of a T-Rex. Nailed it. Jamie, you gave away the answer. No, it was <laughs> Bodie's class. OK, good, good job. <laughs> you are correct. This is the lower jaw, part of the lower jaw of a Tyrannosaurus rex. He has these really big teeth. Uh, and so uh, we can look inside the bones of all kinds of dinosaurs, Triceratops, Myasaura studies have been done on Tyrannosaurus rex. And so it's uh, been discovered that a big T-Rex, like one with, with a jaw like this, I think the oldest T-Rex that's been aged by looking inside of its bones so far is about 28 years old. So we can tell things about how long dinosaurs lived, how quickly they grew, and a lot uh, by looking inside their bones. And so uh, I think, you know, it's important to remember that dinosaurs were really, really cool. Some of them got to be really, really big. But like other animals, dinosaurs had lives. They, they, they changed as they grew. They grew up from little babies to big adults. 
and we can learn a lot about them throughout their entire uh, lifespans. Is there a question? We want to know how long the Triceratops lived. Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, this is, this is uh, we don't know yet, but it's actually something we're, we're working on here at the Museum of the Rockies. If, I, if we walked into the uh, lab just down the hall from here, you would see that it's filled with the leg bones of Triceratops that we are cutting up and looking inside of uh, so we can get an idea of how long Triceratops lived. So we have a good idea for some other dinosaurs, like T-Rex and Myasaura, and we're just learning now about Triceratops by looking inside their bones. Any other questions before we, while well, we have John here? We'll probably take one last question. I don't think so, John. No other questions? All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're happy to spend time learning about dinosaurs, learning from Dr. John Scanella here. Join us again on January 22nd when we talk about dinosaur evolution. Yep, it's gonna be great. We'll see you then, thanks. Thank you.